Tiny Games is the name of the class that I just finished my recent semester of university. It basically taught us a bunch of different simplistic 8-bit retro game engines. So not your Unity or your Unreal, but things like Bitsy and Twine and Puzzle Script, and of course, the holy grail, Pico 8. Now, Pico 8 is absolutely adorable. It's what was used to make the arcade version of Celeste that you can play within Celeste. It's all pixel art, but you can do so much with it. Games can look a ton of different ways, but the engine itself looks like this. Well, this is the start screen, but if you press escape, then this is where you write your code, this is where you do your artwork, this is where you make your tile sets, and this is where you program your music. And that's, that's a lot of functionality, honestly. You have all the pillars of game development that you need here in this little tiny 8-bit engine. Now for this tiny games class of mine, we had about a month long unit of purely learning Pico 8 and Lua, which is the programming language that it uses. Now I've done a decent bit of game development, that's, that's obviously why I have this channel, but nothing has challenged me to make so many small projects in such a short span of time outside of this class. But it all had to start somewhere and it started with Flappy Bird. Recreating basic arcade games or just really simple games is the way to learn game development, in my opinion. Because it forces you to not get caught up in the ideas of the games that you eventually want to make that are probably really complicated, and actually sit down, learn to code, get something made. Flappy Bird is a pretty good one because you don't need a player controller really, you don't have to do a lot of movement. All you really have to do is assign some upwards motion to a little player sprite when you click a button, put some physics on that so it does a little bounce, and then make it to where if you collide with a pipe, death. Those pipes do need to be spawning in at random heights and you need to keep track of a score, but outside of that, there's really not that much to it. All in all, my Flappy Bird was really not that much code. I had this little duck sprite created, which is not my finest work, but it's okay. He's able to flap, he's able to perish, the game, the game is there. It's more of a cave diving thing than it really is Flappy Bird, but the goal is to not hit the edges, so it's the same principle. For this, I was following a written Pico 8 tutorial by Dylan Bennett, which is how my professor taught us most of Pico 8. It gave us all the code that we needed in these little chunks, it explained everything, it was a great foundation for just learning a new engine. But that's boring, so our second Pico 8 assignment was to take this Flappy Bird game and then put some sort of spin on it to make it our own. Some people just made it harder to where the walls will close in faster, other people added bullets or obstacles that you have to dodge. So in my version, um, you slowly peel back the layers of reality and are faced with the existential question of what your purpose is as this duck. You know, you're flying, but why? Where are you going? Do you have a family that you're flying home to? Or perhaps you're running away from something. Either way, it, it doesn't matter. You are nothing more than an arrangement of pixels on this screen, simulating a life that will last eternally. You will fly forever at the discrepancy of a player, a stranger, and the only escape is death. So that was, that was my take on Flappy Bird. Anyway, the second game that I made in Pico 8 was following another tutorial from my professor. This time it was for recreating Lunar Lander, another classic arcade game. I'm sure you're familiar, but you have to carefully descend a spaceship, and if you go too fast, then you will crash and die, but you also can't run out of gas by going too slow, and you have to land on a physical crash pad. The same logic that went into randomly generating the cave walls in the first one went into the spikes at the bottom of the screen on this one. I made a little squid looking guy in place of our spaceship. If you can avoid slaughtering him on the spikes, then you get a little bit of love from him. We were also tasked in upgrading this game in some way and putting our own spin on this one too. Sadly, I went a little bit less existential with this one. I just added bullets that fly across the screen you have to dodge. Cool stuff, very cute. I like the colors that I went with. Now, if I were to really jazz this up, I probably would have randomized the color of the bullets in the octopus every time. But for a two day assignment for this tiny games class, we bawled. It was at this point that me and my classmates were off on our own. It was time to leave the nest. No more tutorials. We would be writing 100% of the code ourselves. Not 90%. And we were done recreating arcade games too. This time we'd be getting a prompt, kind of like a game jam, and then having to make a game in accordance to that prompt. In the past for this class, we had stuff like suburbia, fragile, things like that. So for our third assignment, the prompt was 
<laughs> a shoot 'em up game. Now, a shoot 'em up game, which is also called a shmup, I learned, I love that word, is basically any game where you're almost constantly moving forward, shooting forward, and you have to probably collect ammo, destroy little guys that come your way. You're, you're shooting them up, essentially. It's definitely usually like a space game. Now, going into this assignment, I wasn't really sure what direction I wanted to take it, but I did know two things for sure. One, I was not gonna make a space game because conformity is weakness. And two, even if I don't have an idea fully nailed down, the one thing my game development journey has taught me is to just make something anyway. Even if I didn't really know what the shoot 'em up game was gonna be, I knew that I needed a player controller that could shoot bullets, I needed to be able to collect ammo, so I just went ahead and programmed that. But the little cubes that I made actually reminded me a lot of seeds, and that got me thinking of Mother Nature. My mom is very into plants, and she really likes bees, so I had the idea of making the player a bee, and you have to shoot forward at seeds that are incoming in order to pollinate them. This means that the ammo that you pick up can be the pollen, and then if you shoot the seed or the bullet that's incoming, it can grow into a little flower. Now, the goal wouldn't be to just shoot as many flowers as possible, that would be a little bit boring. So instead, every time you pollinate a flower and it grows, that then takes up room on the screen and you can't hit that flower. So now you have to kind of strategically position the flowers in the right spot, or else you run the risk of potentially not being able to get to pollen, you box yourself in, and you have to be very mindful about where you pollinate. Nice. See, now, now we have an actual game. One benefit of having this project through an in-person class is that we had dedicated days for playtesting. So after I got to test this build of my game, I got the feedback that it'd be nice to have more of a visual indicator for your pollen, and then also just some more variety. So next day, I changed the pollen counter to a visual bar, and I added some more effects for the pollen. They kind of do a little thing side to side now. Really small changes, but they changed the way that the game felt a lot. Programming this game actually wasn't that bad, but if you look closely, um, you might notice that all the code is in this atrocious pixel art font. I, I love the commitment to the aesthetic, guys, but why can I not scroll horizontally? Why do I have to arrow key over to the end of the line and then inevitably miss it and then go back up and, and do it again? There's a chance that I'm just missing something with the controls, and one of you guys will kindly tell me about it in the comments. But I literally just coded everything in Visual Studio, and then I'd copy-paste it into Pico 8 whenever I needed to test anything. There definitely is a way to connect Visual Studio to Pico 8, but I was a peasant running off the free education edition of Pico, so I did not have these luxuries at my disposal. All right, three games down, in less than three weeks at this point. I felt comfortable in Pico 8, and it was time for our final project. Our final project was to use Starfall PR. Or, sorry, that, that's actually not our final project, but that is today's sponsor. Starfall PR offers affordable and tailored marketing for your game. We're talking coverage with press and creators and landing you those placements and event opportunities that you might never find otherwise. They even offer self-publishing guidance for things like localization, QA testing, community management, and much more. I was at GDC recently, which is the largest game development conference in the world, and you see all these booths for these games, the press interviews, the networking meetings. This is one of the many things that Starfall PR can get for your game. And Starfall PR is built like me, okay? They understand the indie game development grind. They know that it's gonna look different than AAA development. That's why they offer the most affordable rate in the whole industry for indie game marketing. They're flexible to what you want and need and can work with your timeline and budget. They know how hard it is to make a game and that it's basically your child and they want to help make yours shine. Starfall PR is based in the US, but they have experience taking on games all over the world. Head over to starfallpr.com to get all the details you need and see their past work. Or don't hesitate to just reach out to them directly so you can get the ball rolling and see what they can do for you specifically. Thank you to Starfall PR for sponsoring and let's get back to the video. For the final project of my tiny games class, we could use any engine that we had used in the class so far and we could make literally any game given that we put enough effort into it. That sounds great, that sounds nice to have so much creative freedom, but if you've ever made a game before, you probably know that having some kind of restriction is actually really nice. The more open-ended a project is, the easier it is to spend in the ideation phase before you actually make anything. My first idea was to go real existential with it and recreate the Chrome no Wi-Fi dinosaur game, except break the fourth wall, the dinosaur knows he's in a game, and you basically have to try and save him before your internet connection comes back. 
I didn't hate that idea, but I wanted to do something that was more gameplay focused than narrative focused. I have a habit of coming up with really cool sounding game ideas that have really strong narratives, and then coming up with the gameplay to try and accommodate that concept, which isn't necessarily doomed for failure, but in my experience, it's a lot better to find a fun mechanic or a fun gameplay loop and then worry about the story or the narrative. So I kicked the dinosaur idea to the curb and I tried to come up with a new one. And lo and behold, I found this. This was some abandoned art from an old platforming game that I had abandoned years ago. The concept here was pretty much a color-based platformer where you're only able to land on platforms of the same color. So you'd have to maybe jump and then midair switch, switch again, parkour, like have some, some cool platforming sequences that involve switching quickly. Not necessarily a super complicated project, but I, I guess I abandoned it nonetheless. But this seemed like the perfect opportunity to pick it up again. And this time, I would recreate it with a smaller scope, and I would do it in Pico 8. I decided that there would be three colors, just to keep it nice and simple, and you'd phase through anything that isn't the same color as you. Now, the hardest part of coding this was actually the collision system. Switching the colors with a button is fine, landing on the right platform depending on your color is also not that hard, but it was the random niche situations that proved to really require some thinking. I kind of made my own viewport to where the camera would follow the player, which was a little bit janky, it was a little bit slow. So it didn't do a perfect job at detecting collisions, especially when the collision would change to a different color. I also had to figure out questions like, what if you were halfway on one color and halfway on another? What happens if you jump over a block and then you switch to that color? Should you jump on top of the platform? Should you be pushed down? You can probably answer those questions, and it probably depends on like what percent of the player is over what color, but to actually implement it and code that was, was probably my biggest struggle. The final version of the collision system has it to where if you're at all colliding with a color and then you switch to that color, you'll just teleport to the top of the block. Is that ideal? No, definitely not. But can I use that for some cool platforming sequences? Probably. See, that's right, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Making the levels was also a bit of a pain. I'm definitely used to the privilege of visual engines where you can drag and drop platforms in order to make the game. I had to manually program the exact coordinates of every wall, which <laughs> now that I'm saying it, I realize there is a tile system that I probably could have used, but it's fine, it's fine, it's, it's fine, it's fine. I ended up with three levels of increasing difficulty. If I had more time, I definitely would have put more effort into the physical layout design design of the levels, and I also probably would have changed the art, but I kind of like the simplistic bold style that I've got going. Also, isn't the difference between this and this, like, kind of crazy? Like, literally all that I did was just take out the four corner pixels and suddenly it looks a lot cleaner and a lot more professional. For a Pico 8 game, which is meant to be visibly simplistic, you know, I think it works. I was so used to playing this game myself and speed running through it that I was worried it would be too easy. But turns out, for the average person who is not the developer, it's actually kind of a hard experience. It definitely goes to show how blind you become to the difficulty of your own game. After something like this, I have so much sympathy for puzzle game developers. GMTK, I'm looking at you. My favorite part of this process wasn't just making the game though, it was seeing everyone else's projects and making my game, but with other people. It was a solo project, but the difference between programming alone in my room versus being out in a public space sitting around people who are doing the same thing is, is massive. In past game development videos, I've always emphasized the need for a community because it uplifts you so much, but this just really drilled it home for me how important that is. Having people to bounce ideas with, being able to close your computer when you need a break and just talk to another human being. It makes the sucky parts suck so much less. My friend Nathan made a full-blown turn-based combat RPG in Pico 8, which was awesome. Another person did this grocery simulator thing where you have to shelve products as these little blobs are actively messing up all your work. There was so much awesome stuff. It's so cool to be in a space where everyone's working towards the same thing and then see the fruit of everyone's thing. The human brain can do some cool stuff sometimes, and this was a reminder that I too can do cool stuff sometimes. And people really liked my game. A lot of people said that if it was a full-blown game, they would actually play it. After my last video, I'm kind of tempted to see if I can make this like a co-op game in Game Maker, but we'll see. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.